Let's see. Uh, Mallory is teaching the book of Job. <coughs> and uh, Kelly is pretty much Lamentations. <laughs> and a few other things. And so I will be uh, doing the Psalms. And in this first class, or maybe first couple of classes, I'm going to be going over just some facts about Psalms. And some of it <clears throat> um, is historical information, and uh, uh, some of it is just, you know, just general information. <clears throat> and I usually do that on subjects like this at the very beginning so that you can have the background and that sort of stuff. And this is the kind of stuff that most Bible schools will give you. Uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, that being done either this first class or the second class, we will get into some meatier things, me meatier things. Uh, and uh, see the Lord in some of these uh, psalms. <clears throat> and I will say this, I have... Uh, I've enjoyed the search on the Psalms. Um, I've enjoyed the preparations of the Lord uh, for me and hopefully that effect that it'll have upon you. Um, <clears throat> all right, so the first reality is is that the Psalms are really different in a lot of ways than all the other books of the Bible in that they really give the human side of things. <clears throat> I mean, think about it compared to, say, Romans or something. Uh, and it, in there, it'll show fear as well as faith. It'll show you, you know, a gamut of reactions and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that I'm always blessed about with the Psalms is that it shows you a heart after God. Is that man or devil? <laughs> It shows you a heart after God while still being in weakness. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's good for all of us. Can anybody say amen to that? You know, that you can actually be in weakness or be going through stuff and still be with God. <clears throat> because a lot of Christianity teaches, folks, that if you're going through something or you're messed up or you're having a hard time, that God isn't with you and you can't be with God. You know what I mean? I mean, it really, it, it uh, include, and I'll just be honest with you, I include in that sin. They say, well, if you're in sin, then you can't be with God or whatever. Let me tell you something. The only person you need to be with is God, no matter what, up, down, bad, good, no matter what. <clears throat> and he loves you no matter what. And uh, the, te the, the, the basic teaching of mu much of Christianity that you can't be with God is wrong. Not, it, and let's put it this way. It's not New Testament. Okay. The Lord is with you. And, and if you can't be with God while you're in sin, how are you going to get out of sin? God, but you can't get to him the way they teach it. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? You know, well, I'm sorry. You know, it's like, I'd like to help you, but you're in sin. Well, then you'll be in it forever. But the truth is... <clears throat> The Lord loves us. He's with us. Jesus died to save us. He already died. It's not like there's not a, a, a sacrifice already settled. The only settling part is getting that wor at work in us. Okay? <clears throat> so, um, so it, it actually, the Psalms deal with, you know, human failures, but still trusting in the Lord, still finding the Lord as a refuge. <clears throat> um, and then some of my notes I wrote, it reflects the inner feelings of the person whose soul is stirred by thoughts of God or, or by problems. I mean, isn't that interesting? Because you can be thoroughly stirred up after the Lord. And you can also be thoroughly stirred up over your problems. <laughs> and that's just a fact. And God's meeting Whoever, you know, because David isn't the only one who wrote the Psalms. God is meeting those people right where they're at. <clears throat> um, one of the few books that gives you the mental state, soulish turmoil, or spiritual condition of the physical history given in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Second Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. 
And that's one of the things I hope to get into is that in, in those books I just named off, it tells you of actual historical events that are going on. And then the Psalms will refer to them and tell you what they're, what this story is telling you what they're going through. The Psalms is telling you what's going on on the inside of them while they're going through that particular situation. And um, I think that helps. <clears throat> uh, I have a tendency in my newsletter that I put out every month not to write a lot of personal stuff. <clears throat> But some months ago, I put out an article that really dealt with a lot of personal stuff. <clears throat> and, uh, and, and Mallory, who does my editing, came to me and she said, you know, this is, this is different than normal. You don't normally do this. Uh, do you want to do this? Is, you know, and that's her, her place, that's to help you know, guide through stuff like that. And I said, you know what? <clears throat> I remember reading of, of someone like Watchman Nee or, or T. Austin Sparks or Jesse Penn Lewis and hearing their writings and then reading something about what they were going through during that time and how they were going through struggles and trouble and everything else and yet keeping their eyes on Jesus but still going through it. And I said, that helped me, you know. Because there's some sort of a thought that if anybody's really seeing the Lord, they must be up on the mountaintop. They must be way up there, far above any problems, and that's why they're seeing all that. And the example that came to my mind was Jacob. Jacob cheats his brother. His brother's going to kill him for it. He's on the run. He doesn't have anybody, doesn't have family anymore, doesn't have home anymore. He's on the run, and at Bethel, when he has totally messed up, God starts revealing everything to this guy, you know, and starts opening the truth to him when he's at his lowest. And we always think it's going to be at our highest. And I say, no, because then we'll start boasting in ourselves. We'll think, it's because I fasted. It's because I, you know, it's because I. Whatever you want to tack on behind that, we're attributing that to us instead of to the grace of God. To the grace of God. Anybody for the grace of God around here? <laughs> Me too. Thank God. Thank God. <clears throat> All right. So, um, as I said, Psalms is a book expressing our feelings for God or to God and not just doctrinal instruction. Um, Psalms is not defending the truth in any sort of doctrinal way, but it is faith in that truth at work during the crisis. And when it's all said and done, we can read Romans. But folks, if we never get that working in us and have, and have occasion to have faith in it in our crisis, what good is it? And that's what Psalms is to me, is that it is, it is not just teaching. In fact, it's not even hardly teaching you a bunch of deep doctrinal things as much as it is someone who's standing on those truths no matter what. <clears throat> so... Um, the Psalms are poetry, <clears throat> and it's poetry set to music. That's exactly what the Psalms are. And uh, I wrote a little phrase here, poetry is a little incarnation. It gives body and form to what had been invisible or unheard. <clears throat> and um, those of you who write poetry know that. Those of you who write songs know that. It gives body to something that maybe wasn't even heard by you, but the Lord gives it to you, or certainly hasn't been heard by others, and you're able to express something. You're able to express Christ in a way that you weren't able to do in, in any other form. <clears throat> so, uh, but there is this fact that many times these Psalms and what they're telling us, they are inspired responses of Christ through vessels of clay. In other words, 
They are literal quotations that Jesus quoted on the cross. Coming through vessels of clay. We have this treasure. You're not the treasure. I'm not the treasure. He is the treasure. And that's not bad news, that's good news. Because the excellency, the power doesn't rest with us. It's not dependent on us. We're not holding up the world. I, what is the name of that? The Atlas, the, the guy, the big strong guy holding the globe, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know. Arnold Schwarzenegger in his heyday, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I am no Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Jim's even less. <laughs> Sorry, just picking on But we got one that's stronger than Governor Arnie. We got one that's stronger than Atlas. It's the Lord. It's the Lord himself. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, David and these guys who are writing these psalms, <clears throat> they're writing in their pain and in, in their circumstances, but really it's not them at all. It's the cry of the Lord in relationship to the cross. And, and we're going to get into that. We're going to show you that, that those men probably thought it was them. And many times when you're going through something, you probably think it's you, just you going through something. And it's not. You are one with Jesus. Do you believe that? You are one. And what you're experiencing may be what the Lord has experienced at Calvary. And it is, his, it is the working of Christ and him crucified on the inside of you. And you're crying out. And if you don't know that, you'll just think, well, you're, you're going through agony. You know, I mean, can you imagine this? If it just came to you one day and you said, oh, and you didn't, know, you didn't know the New Testament that well. You didn't know those things. And you were, oh, man, everything is so hard. And it just seemed like God has left me. My God, why have you forsaken me? Anybody recognize that? <laughs> Jesus said it on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And yet we're going, and then we'll condemn ourselves, thinking, he said he'd never leave me nor forsake me. And, and Lord willing, we'll get into that in Psalm 22 and show you exactly why many of these psalms are different than just struggles and trials. Because they are not just struggles and trials. They are the manifestation of the revelation of the cross at work in human beings. You see, we think just life is random. Life's just random. I'm just going through stuff. The devil's mean. Well, I agree with that. <laughs> but your life is ordered. Your life is after a pattern of Christ and him crucified. It's not just a bunch of random stuff going on. <clears throat> um, the Psalms are not just a book of comfort for us in bad circumstances, but utterances of Christ through vessels of clay. They speak of death and resurrection as seen in the cycle of the, the, that cycle of death and resurrection. This, this thing where we are one with Christ and what he went through, we're going through because it's still his life but it's his life in you, see. Now, we may be totally unaware of that. We may not identify with that. We may think it's just us and we need to call on God somewhere far away who's not going through anything. But that's almost, I mean, the vast majority of the Psalms is people in trouble crying out to God, but it is, more than that, it is the Lord at work in his people. <clears throat> All right, let me give you some historical facts about the Psalms. The Psalms were composed over a span of about a thousand years. The earliest writer was Moses. He wrote Psalm 90. And then later on, some of the other Psalms, a couple of them looked like they were written around the time when Israel was carried away 
captive in the Babylonian captivity. Um, some relate to God's glory in the past, and some speak of God's promise in the future, but the vast majority are speaking about God right then in the present. Now, that's, I think that's significant. You know, you do realize that much of Christianity talks about what happened a long time ago, 2,000 years ago when Jesus walked the earth, and what's going to happen when he comes back and sort of forgets right now. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, the writer of the Psalms didn't. They, they primarily talked about what's going on right now and their relationship with God right now. And finding the Lord right now. Um, <clears throat> Psalms is the longest book in the Bible. It's also got the longest chapter, which is Psalm 119. Um, it's pretty much right in the middle of the Bible. If you, you know, you know, if you tried to find the middle of your Bible, and I had a friend when I was in when I was in Bible college, I had a friend who was going through turmoil, and he said, "I need answers from God," and so he knew Psalms was pretty much right in the middle, and he said, "I'm just gonna." I'm just going to open my Bible and throw my hand down on the scripture and God's going to speak to me. And he, so, you know, he's like sort of aiming toward the middle so he could hit the Psalms, hoping he'd get some comfort, you know. He throws it open and throws it down and he hit Psalm 22 and he hit that verse that said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Went, this is a stupid method. We, we shouldn't do this kind of stuff. But what's funny is he, he said, but you know what, I'm just going to see if the Lord, and he, Tried to do it again, and, you know, he went, and I think he hit the scripture, says Ju Judas went out and hung himself. And finally he went, look, I just need to pray and <laughs> get with the Lord. Folks, the Bible is not a, a, a tarot card or a, 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 a what? Magic eight ball. Yeah, a magic eight ball or, or a, a horoscope. A horoscope. Um, <laughs> It is where Christ is revealed, and we need to see Jesus. That's the biggest comfort that we could come to. Um, there are 186 quotes from the Psalms in the New Testament. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, I thought, you know, whoa, that's, uh, that's a lot. And I'm going to make some references back to this later on because there's some real significant spiritual things that are involved in this. Psalm 110 is real short, only a few verses, but it is uh, the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. Psalm 110, I mean it's like six verses if I'm not mistaken. It's just incredibly short. And um, uh, Psalm 118 verse 22, just that one verse in Psalm 118 is quoted six times in the New Testament. Anybody know what that verse is? Psalm 118, uh, verse 22. Okay, just, just check it. <clears throat> uh, we call it Psalms, but there's also prayers. In other words, some of them say a prayer of David or a prayer. Uh, <clears throat> and the Psalms are quoted more frequently in the New Testament than any other Old Testament book. Now, does that seem strange? I mean, what about Isaiah? What about Genesis? You know, just pick your favorite book. But the Psalms is quoted more in the New Testament than any other. Um, let's see. Let me just read a statement here. The divine inspiration of the Psalms is strongly affirmed in the New Testament. Jesus asked the Jewish leaders of his day, how doth David in the spirit call him the Messiah Lord? Uh, Jesus was quoting from Psalm 110. Again, Peter quoting from Psalm 69 declares, the Holy Spirit spake before by the mouth of David concerning Judas. That's over in Acts 116. Um, so there are, uh, we'll, we'll get into some of this uh, later on, probably not this class, and hopefully I'd really like to just get the preliminary stuff out of the way as quick as possible. 
so it, it would probably behoove me to read a little bit. <clears throat> so let me talk to you about the nature of Hebrew poetry. Uh, unlike our modern poetry, which is designed to rhyme, most poems rhyme, except mine, <clears throat> uh, Hebrew poetry is characterized by a rhythmic arrangement of thought patterns. It's called parallelism. And uh, uh, scholars distinguish several different types. There is uh, synonymous parallelism. This is where the thought is uttered and then the same idea is expressed but in a different way. I didn't pick out the best example of that, but uh, this is in uh, Psalm 7.1. It says, O Jehovah my God, in thee do I take refuge. Save me from all them who pursue me and deliver me. In other words, it's, it's saying, you're, you're my hope and you're my deliverer, and then it says that again in a, in a different way. And that's how their poetry is. And then they have the opposite of that, where they will say something like, uh, Psalm 1 says this, for Jehovah knoweth, for the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. And so it's not rhyming at all, but the rhythm of it is, you know, saying this, making this statement, and then coming back and making it in a different way. And that's always good because when I was teaching in uh, elementary school, I was taught that for a child to get something, they have to hear it 26 times <laughs> to really get it. So that's why this Bible school is three years. <clears throat> Just kidding. Or am I? <laughs> All right, uh, classifying the Psalms. First, I'm going to, I don't know if I really want to read all of that, but I'm going to give you my classification first. My classification is this. All the Psalms are divided basically into three categories. <clears throat> psalms for deliverance. Psalms confident of deliverance, and Psalms of thanksgiving after deliverance. <laughs> now that's very loose, but nonetheless, most of the Psalms really are relating to crying out to God, you know, you know, help, I need deliverance, uh, uh, or, oh Lord, I know you will deliver me, or, or thank you Lord for delivering me. I mean, that's pretty much the, the content of them. <clears throat> um, However, um, this thing of individual laments, meaning an individual uh, crying out to God, is one-third of all the psalms. There are psalms where there's a corporate crying out, too, a corporate lament. But just the individual lament, one-third of all the psalms. So, I mean, it gives you an idea. I mean, what does that tell you? If you just think about that, what does that tell you? It tells you, I'm sorry, God hears you. What else? Lots of people need to cry out to God. Uh, there's an enemy. I mean, you know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff we can come up with. There is an enemy. There's, uh, you're going to be persecuted. Uh, life, the Christian life isn't a bed of roses. How many of you have already started thinking that that may be the case, that it's not that? Okay, good. Um, the basic um, categories, category, categories that uh, I took from a book, I'm just going to, uh, God, is uh, the first category is Psalms of Praise. And, uh, of course, this is lifting up the Lord and um, uh, affirming the Lord. Then there are historical psalms, and these are psalms that bring in stories like Abraham and Joseph and Israel and Egypt and stuff like that. There are ethical psalms. Remember now, this is, I got this from a book, so this isn't, but, you know, save you the time of doing it. Um, the ethical psalms, uh, some of the psalms emphasize the origin and nature of man. They stress his moral responsibility and his accountability. Um, psalms of penitence. And uh, these, are, these are like Psalms 51 where David repents to the Lord. 
And then uh, uh, psalms for destruction of your enemies. I call them destruction of enemy psalms. <laughs> and, you know, anybody ever prayed for the destruction of your enemies? Uh, I don't know if I'll get into it. <clears throat> I don't know if I'll get into it, but because uh, I, when I dig into something to teach for you, I really dig in, okay? I mean, I don't just sort of, I really dig in. And some of the things I ran across that were in these Psalms for destruction of your enemies, would blow your mind. It would blow your mind. I mean, one place I, I didn't mark it down, and I'll probably run across it later. <clears throat> he said, oh, you know, let, may your babies be cut up into pieces, and may you, you know, and I'm going, dude, just chill a little while. <laughs> you, know, just, just, you know, stay before the Lord. <laughs> <clears throat> And then uh, the Messianic Psalms, which I wrote everything that is on that here, because when I started studying this and started reading about the Messianic Psalms, it disturbed me. The general statements made by scholars about the Psalms and the Messianic Psalms disturbed me because I felt like... <clears throat> They had, it was almost like some sort of a category. We have a category that talks about Jesus. You see what I mean? Can some of you who know me well know why that would disturb me? There's a category that talks about Jesus. Aren't you glad? <clears throat> so, um, uh, so I'll just read my own notes now. Uh, Messianic Psalms, and I wrote a whole bunch that they call Messianic Psalms. Uh, they say these speak of Jesus, but the whole book declares Jesus. Can I get an amen? Jesus said, Behold, in the volume of the book, it is written to me. Jesus said, Search the scriptures, for they are they which testify of me. Jesus opened on, to those in the road to Emmaus the Old Testament, the Psalms, not just the prophets and the law and all that the Psalms, and began to show himself there. So people thought the Psalms were only devotional. But since the incarnation of Christ, many have found uh, them to be about Christ and the cross, meaning there were many things written there that were about Jesus that they didn't know until after the incarnation. Uh, the term Messianic Psalm is, well, this is my words again, is ridiculous. It all speaks of Christ. We call it that because we have a written record in the New Testament where these psalms are used, but we also have a written record in the New Testament that, in the, vo that the volume of the book speaks of him. Do you understand what I just said? There are psalms in the New Testament, or there are, there are places in the New Testament that are that are what Jesus said found in the Psalms. And so we say, oh, those are Messianic Psalms. But also in the New Testament, Jesus said, the volume of the book speaks of me. Just because we found a few places doesn't mean those are the only places that speak of Jesus. Um, Many of the psalms that they didn't designate as messianic psalms were discovered to be after the cross. How many more speak of Christ, but we do not know him well enough. In other words, they were not just meant for moving men's hearts toward God, but spoke of something higher. They spoke of Christ. These are examples used in, um, and I'm speaking now of examples used in, in Genesis of, of Isaac and Ishmael. Uh, but they're not, they're not quotes by Jesus. Um, but they do refer to Christ, for they saw Jesus in historical examples. Um, in other words, not just quotations that Jesus said, but when they saw Isaac and Ishmael, they saw Jesus and not just that there's a, this is just a historical story. 
They said, this speaks of the Lord. Okay. Um, in other words, the Old Testament is not just giving us Jesus' utterances, but shows him by the stories and incidents that appear to have nothing to do with him. Their purpose was about Jesus and not first about us. Their purpose was about Jesus and not first about Isaac and Ishmael. Their purpose was first about Christ and not Abraham. Their purpose was first about, you understand? All of those are either Bible stories that we tell our kids or they're Christ. But we don't just, I mean, it, it's good to tell kids Bible stories to get them familiar with the stories in the Bible, right? But we cannot just tell them that and say, now that's all there is, wasn't that a great story? We say to them, now this sounds like it's about Noah, but this is about Jesus, you know? And we say that to our own heart too when we read something, when we don't see Jesus. Holy Spirit, open my eyes. Help me to comprehend the book, not just the material. And the best way to do that the best way to comprehend the book is to check in with the author. All right, who wrote the Psalms? Well, David wrote 73 Psalms. <clears throat> um, in 2 Samuel 23.1, David is called the sweet psalmist of Israel. Dude, I mean, I, I would like a name like that. There are names for me, but but the word sweet is not in there. <laughs> uh, David played the, the uh, harp, or it's called a lyre, L-Y-R-E. Um, let's see, it may seem that David wrote a lot of songs, 72, but his son Solomon wrote a thousand and five, according to First Kings four thirty-two. You know, and so you go, David. Pardon? Uh, seventy-three. I don't know why I said seventy-two there, because it's seventy-three. Um, but Solomon wrote a thousand and five. That's a lot of songs. That's not easy to do. Anybody ever tried to write a song? Anybody ever sit down and say, "I'm going to write a song"? What was that like? <laughs> It's really disastrous. It is one of the hardest things to do. Um, off the record here, one of my favorite Saturday Night Live things is when this guy is trying to write a hit song and the devil tempts him by telling him he'll give him a hit song if he'll sell his soul to him. And so the devil is going to try to concentrate to write a hit song. <laughs> And he goes through the same stuff we would if we're trying to do it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, give me a break, man. I'm, I'm trying to write this song. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it is genuinely hard to do that. The best way to do it is just, you know, let some inspiration come when you're not thinking about it. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Uh, David's singing and playing cal uh, calmed demonized Saul in 1 Samuel 16, 23. Are you familiar with that? Saul, King Saul had demons. And David was called in to, to play for him, and he would play, and it would calm the demons down. Is that cool? Maybe while I'm preaching, we should play soft music. <laughs> <clears throat> um, in other words, though he was a great warrior and defeated men like Goliath, he was also a spiritual warrior, spiritual warfare. However, or but, though his music calmed demons, only the revelation of Christ in the Psalms that he wrote permanently changed the people of the book of Acts. And the reason why I said specifically that is I, wanna, I cannot wait to get into the second Psalm and show you some things. But that the book of Acts is full of them seeing Jesus 
in the Psalms. And, you know, so you have the example, and this is the way we think, this American Christianity, oh, if I could use my music to just calm people who are demonized, wouldn't that be wonderful? Oh, yes, it would be wonderful, but folks, my God, Saul never did change. You know what I mean? I mean, what is it, your ministry to demons? I mean, if you think about it, I mean, isn't that really what it is? Because Saul didn't change. All you're doing is, you know, demons are going, oh, this is nice. <laughs> am, I right? am, I, am I right or wrong? I'm just, you know, you know, and you're going, oh, thank God I have a ministry to demons, you know? You know, uh, I mean, see, most of us wouldn't even, we'd hear about somebody doing that. We'd go, oh, oh. They're like David, the sweet psalmist, you know. You know, let me tell you, David's biggest ministry wasn't, you know, petting demons. His biggest ministry was the things that he wrote in those psalms that impacted the early church, the first church, the new church that came on the scene, and they saw Jesus in his writing. They, they never heard them sung. And today, to this day, you'll never hear any of the psalms sung the way they were back then. Isn't that interesting? There is no record. There's not even a record. There is a, there is a general record, not out of Israel, but of some of the peoples of that time where they have a little bit of music of what it probably sounded like. You know, we, we go, you know, here, here's us. As the deep, and we go, oh, oh, you know. It was probably more like, dong, down, ding, da, da, dong, hi, oh. I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm telling you, it wasn't anything like what we think, you know. But we're all, you know, everything's romantic, everything, oh, oh, David, just sing to me, bing, dong, hi. <laughs> anyway, sorry, <laughs> but it is the truth. I mean, the, the Middle Eastern music, is weird <laughs> it is you know okay well and you hear some of the arab arab music too and it's like oh, oh, oh you know anybody know ahab the arab the sheik of the burning sand? you know oh, 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 oh. Uh, Jim Carrey's uh, that <laughs> you have to see that one too. But <laughs> that is one of the funniest things you'll ever see. But <clears throat> I'm gonna have to find that and play it for you. But anyway, it is, yeah. <clears throat> but I mean, we you know we've just got all of this idealized whatever and. You know, all he's trying to do, all David's trying to do is point to Jesus. That's all that's in his heart. He loved the Lord. He had a heart after music. No. He had a heart after God. You know, he had a heart after songwriting. No. And, and we will fail the man uh, if we don't get to Jesus through what he's trying to present to us, you know. And I believe that's true of anybody that truly loves the Lord. All they want you to do is get to Jesus. You know, I mean, I'll tell you that that's exactly where I stand on this situation. The church, everything, it only exists for one reason. I'm just trying to get people to Jesus. Well, you're getting, no, you're trying to be a big cult leader and lord over everybody. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm just, I work on that regularly. My God. You know, all I want is people to know the Lord. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> so um, let's see. Uh, David did uh, seventy-three of the Psalms. Asaph, or the sons of Asaph, did um, twelve. Um, now I'm gonna I'm gonna say this now though. I I have who am I? I don't know anything. Okay. But I'm just going to tell you my opinion. I have questions whether Asaph wrote all of those. Number one, for two reasons. One, one of them is it's David. 
it uses David's examples. It flows the way David's psalms do. I mean, I'm, I'm reading it and I'm going, look, you know, I sense David here. And the other one is, is that it says for Asaph or for the sons of Asaph as if David wrote it and presented it to them because they were singers in the thing. So we'll get into all that as we go, but I'm just saying, you know, I'm going with what the scholars say because what do I know? <laughs> but maybe there's something more to that. Solomon wrote uh, two of them. Uh, uh, Ethan wrote Psalms 89. What's funny is the way I put my notes was Ethan uh, equals 89. And I went, oh, he wrote 89 more than David? <clears throat> no, Psalms 89. The sons of Korah wrote 12. Moses wrote one. Um, a guy named Heman, or you could pronounce it He-Man. And I wrote, a true He-Man needs Jesus. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and it will, you know, it will be in my, you know, like real men love Jesus. <laughs> a true He-Man needs Jesus. Uh, just Psalm 88, <clears throat> which, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm just this is something from a long time ago. If I'm not mistaken, you know how most of the Psalms go into like David will say, "Oh Lord, you know I cry, my enemy is this," and he's complaining and everything. But he, in the end, he ends up going, "You know I will praise the Lord." You know, but he starts out all depressed. If I'm not mistaken, Psalm 88 is the one where he never gets out of it. It's like a nosedive, and he never pulls up. <laughs> You know, so if you're not doing good, don't read that one. Because <laughs> you know, it's just bad. It just keeps going down and down and down until you crash and burn. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about uh, the uh, Psalms of Korah or the sons of Korah. Uh, Psalm 42 through 49, 84 through 85, and 87 through 88. Uh, the Korah or the sons of Korah, most of their psalms are concerned with Zion, which is pretty cool when you understand what Zion represents. <clears throat> uh, they mention this river that makes glad the city of God, and that river is also found in uh, many of the prophets, uh, Isaiah. Ezekiel, Joel, Zechariah, and we know that that has to do with a, a true flow from the heart of the Lord filling that city. Uh, the sons of Korah, and what I'm going to do is instead of turning to all these scriptures, I just want to kind of get through this part if I can, but if you want all these scriptures later on, I can let you look at this, but the, the reason why I'm even mentioning it is there's some really good stuff I searched out and, and found in relationship to these guys. And knowing the scriptures is real important. I mean, how, how's God going to open our eyes to the spiritual truth if we don't know the scriptures, right? Mallory, aren't you going to be teaching on searching the scriptures? There? Uh, the sons of Korah were temple gatekeepers, according to 1 Chronicles 26.1. They kept the gate of Zion. Man. You know, that's, that's the veil, isn't it? I mean, isn't the, isn't the gate of Zion, and uh, for David before Solomon, isn't that the veil that you enter into? It is. <laughs> because why? Because the tabernacle of David that had the Ark of the Covenant was just the Holy of Holies. It wasn't the rest of it. The only gate to that whole thing, the only door in was the veil. And these guys go, come on in, come in. Access straight directly to God. Pretty cool. New Testament type dudes. <laughs> um, also, they were singers in the temple according to 1 Chronicles 20, 19. <clears throat> The uh, Psalms of Asaph, or the Sons of Asaph, that's uh, Psalm 50 and 73 through 83. Asaph was also a singer and musician, according to 1 Chronicles 15, uh, 16 through 19, and 16, 4 through 5. 
<clears throat> and then uh, Asaph was also a seer, uh, 2 Chronicles 29, 30. And what does it mean to be a seer? It's one who sees the things of the Lord. They don't just talk about it. They don't just, they see. And that's really, that's what they used to call the prophets, you know, uh, a seer. They didn't just say, you know, we say, well, I want to prophesy to you. I haven't seen anything. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But here it goes. You are going to be great. God is going to bless everything you do, and you'll never have a tr problem in your life. And everybody will love you. I mean, that's the kind of, you know, you know I, I'm getting off a little bit here, but I want you to consider that most of the prophecies that you hear in churches are like that. They're, oh, God's going to bless you and do all this stuff. You know, most of the prophets spoke and said, you know, you've got a problem. There's going to be some stuff, you know, there, you need to wake up. Am I right or wrong? I mean, uh, you know, but you don't ever hear anybody prophesy in the church, you know, like that. You know, woe unto you, you know, or, you know, Quoting scriptures, you know. Uh, oh, brother, I just have a word from the Lord. I have a scripture for you. It's in Revelation. I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And him that rode upon it was death, and hell followed after. You know, and they're going, what? You know, what are you saying? You know. <clears throat> so, um, but, but he was a seer. And then the sons of Asaph, I've got a bunch of scriptures on them, everything from 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. And it does say that they prophesied. And what that, that is, is, and I, I believe that you can write songs that are, that are speaking prophetically. But to me, the true spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. And it says that in the book of Revelation. The spirit of Prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. The actual prophecy may be literal, just like, just like First Chronicles was a literal story, or just like Isaac and, and uh, Ishmael was a literal story. But the spirit of it is the testimony of Jesus. Does that make sense? Well, it should, because that's the whole meaning of this. <clears throat> um, so, uh, let's see, the sons of Asaph attest, let's see, oh, they speak of the destruction of the temple in Psalm 74 and 79. Uh, their psalms are concerned with <clears throat> judgment. Their psalms have a lot of judgment in there. Uh, I've got, and I've, I've got a bunch of scriptures on all these, judgment on Israel, judgment on Jerusalem, judgment on foreign nations, judgment on wicked individuals, and judgment on the gods. Okay? They also deal with God's mighty deeds in the past, which I found to be interesting when I was searching it, because they're prophetic, but they're bringing up the past. And that's where you're going to begin to see the Lord. They speak of the Exodus and a bunch of scriptures on that, the conquest of Canaan, of the period of the judges and of creation. Uh, also, the sons of Asaph make references to God as shepherd and as sheep, almost the only one who does it other than David in Psalm 23. But they really do it a lot. They also have a high number of references to the northern tribes, and they call him by the name of Joseph. I found that interesting because Judah is where David came out of. Judah is where Jesus came out of. Judah is the main tribe. Um, man, I'm, I'm going to need to quit here pretty soon. Um, and then finally, their psalms focus on Israel as a whole. So it's completely not like David who speaks a lot of time. His focus is as an individual. The Asaph and the sons of Asaph speak as if we're all one. Pretty cool. It really is. All right. Uh, I almost got through this. I will get through it the next time. 
and then we will start on Psalm 1. Um, you would get a lot more out of these psalms when I get into them if you'll read, read them in advance and pray over them. <clears throat> Psalm 1 looks pretty self-explanatory, but I believe the Lord has some special stuff for us in there. Psalm 2 is not so self-explanatory, but it is a tremendous, and, and uh, like I said, now I, you know, I'll start next class, next, time, next Thursday, and we'll finish off this historical part, and then we'll jump into some of this really, really good stuff that are, that are in the psalm. Okay, let's take a break, and we'll come back shortly. Let's do a five-minute break. So anybody that has to 